Hello, in this activity we are going to look at the remains of plants left in adobe bricks that were made in 1825 and we'll talk about this in a little bit more. Um, so just so you'll know I am uh, updating this video so the stuff we're seeing now is recent and the stuff that it's interspaced with is stuff that was made a few years ago. So sorry about the confusion, hopefully uh, these little annotations will help make it clear. So what's going to happen is we're going to be basically comparing the data and um, on your this this document I've given you, I have the two sets of data that you need to compare down below. So you can look at it if you need to and I'll make sure that you understand uh, when to look at it and what you need to do. And from that you're going to be answering these questions, one, two, three, and four, and five, and that's it. All right, well let's get started on learning about the Adobe Brick. So now we're into um, plant remains. So uh, we're looking at the an adobe brick from 1825. An adobe brick was taken from the ruins of a Spanish mission on the western edge of the Rancho Grassland study site. It is estimated that that brick was made approximately in 1825 and it contains the remains of plant material from the following proportions. So when they made the bricks, what they would do is they would take mud from the area and let it bake in the sun. Um, they'd form it in the shape of a brick. And so we have the seeds from the native, um, from the plants of that area at that time. And some are native and some are non-native. So all you're going to do is compare um, this graph to the graph of the native, non-native species in your... Let's go ahead and start answering some of these questions. Let's look at number one. Which non-native species must have been introduced to the sample area before 1825? So to answer that, we're going to compare our data. So let's go to the bottom of your document. And at the bottom of the document, we have the plant remains in adobe brick, and we have non-native species from this area. So anything that is on this list here is a plant that was here before 1825 because the seeds were left in the dirt, and the dirt was made into an adobe brick. So we know these plants must have been here before 1825. So, Avena, is that a non-native species? And we go down our list, and sure enough, it's right here. Avena is a non-native species, and it was here before 1825. So that would go in one of your three that were here before. So you would put that right here. Then you'll go down, you'll look for others. Red stem fillery. Red stem fillery is also on this list, so it is a non-native, and it was here before 1825. So I want you to go through, and there's one more plant that is a non-native that is on this list and on this list that was here before 1825. Which additional non-native species have been introduced to the sample area since 1825? So here's our data right here, and we're just looking to see which ones um, are not here, and, but are non-native. So if we go through, we can see that the purple needle nose grass and the fringe um, is a native species. They are not on this list. So uh, we're looking for ones that are um, again, have been introduced since 1825. So we have to cross out the ones that um, were there already. So that's our wild oat was there, so we can cross that one out. That was there before 1825, and that's what we saw in our the question before this. We have our annual bluegrass. Our annual bluegrass um, was here before 1825, so you can cross that one out. And we have our red stem fillery. And our red stem fillery was here between 1425, so you can cross that one out. So that leaves the three that have been introduced since 1825, which is the black mustard, which is the yellow flower, the whip grip rome, which is the one that gets in your socks, the sheep sorrel, and the smooth cat's ear, which is the yellow flowered one that you probably see around but you don't notice it. So those are the four. Now we get down to our final questions. Give an example of how non-native species affected the grassland between 1825 and today. So um, 
again, as cattle people came in, the native grasses, the bunch grasses, um, were eaten by the cattle. And when the cattle were uh, fed hay, and that hay was usually imported from other places, it had seeds of non-native species in there. And so the cows would poop that out, and those seeds would take hold, and pretty soon they took hold everywhere and grew very quickly um, because the cattle would eat the other stuff, which they actually liked better, and then they would trample it down as it was coming up. And so this grass would, had a chance to um, take hold in these disturbed areas. In farming, um, they cut out all of the native species and they put in non-native species, which then had a chance to take hold. And in disturbed areas by, you know, missions or roads or houses, again, they destroyed the grasslands and things that could outcompete the grasslands would take hold like the yellow mustard. So you can give any um, of these as an example of how non-native species affected the grassland. Um, usually it was due to human disturbance and then these non-native species would have a chance to get into the soil and they quickly took hold. Um, and within 50 to 100 years, they, they have a, a slowly started um, or have quickly taken over the whole area. So non-native species have affected grasslands in many ways. Are there um, these long-term or short-term effects? So this is what it used to look like. Again, we had a lot of these California grasses here. And this is what it looks like now. Um, so, you know, you can have your own opinion. Do you think that this is going to continue where it's going to continue to look like this and other non-native species are going to take hold and, and slowly take over? Or do you think it's going to go back to the way it was? Finally, what other variables have contributed to the success of non-native plants? Well, again, most of this has to do with human intervention. Um, so the humans came in, if you've been to Black Diamond Mines, that's what this is. This is the uh, Summersville thing at uh, the Summersville town site. And we came in, we mined coal. And um, in that, we completely disrupted the area, um, dug up dirt, dumped it out. And so uh, the native species were disturbed, and so the non-native species had a chance to take hold. Farming, this is Brentwood in the early 1900s and um, this used to all be grasslands and now it is farmland so uh, disturbed areas the grasslands were taken out and so other plants had a chance of taking hold this is the military base on the other side of um, highway 4 and again the humans came in and we disturbed the grasslands and uh, belt things and that caused a change to the ecosystem because native species um, were disturbed and non-native species had a chance to take hold. So in general non-native species tend to be more successful in disturbed soils because they have the characteristics as you learned earlier um, to outcompete the native species who tend to produce a little bit slower or they're not as efficient in using sunlight and soil.